Thanks for checking out the weekly sermon from Church of the Resurrection. I pray that God will use this message to speak to you and help you grow in your faith journey. If you're in the KC area, I'd like to invite you to join us next week at one of our services or join us in live worship online at core.org worship. Church of the Resurrection is one church in multiple locations. To learn more about the service times and our ministries, please visit core.org. Hope you enjoy this week's message. As we continue in worship, I want to remind you this week at all of our locations, we hosted VBC, Vacation Bible Camp, and our theme was Hero You. In fact, I have David Chow here with us today, and I want to show you this amazing haircut that he got just for the theme of VBC. Isn't this amazing? David, you're awesome. We're so glad that you're here. So he's going to be here to, to share scripture with us. And so I would invite you to hear now these words from the Gospel of John. Look, I tell you, open your eyes and notice that the fields are already ripe for the harvest. Those who harvest are receiving their pay and gathering fruit for eternal life, so that those who sow and those who harvest can celebrate together. This is a true saying, that one sows and another harvests. In Matthew 9, we read these words. Jesus went through all the towns and villages teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless, like a sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into the harvest field. May God add a blessing to the reading, hearing, and understanding of the scripture. Well, today we bring to a conclusion our series of messages on God and tractors, our summer revival. And the sermon's going to end with me driving that tractor off of the chancel here. And, uh, and it'll really summarize today's message and maybe all the messages in the series. In the first sermon in the series, we started off talking about, um, talking about needing to be saved. And, uh, and we talked about getting your tractor stuck. And every, tra every farmer's gotten their tractor stuck somewhere along the way. I've gotten mine stuck many times. And then you need a bigger tractor to pull you out. And so we talked about Jesus coming and saving us, delivering us, rescuing us from the muck and the mire in our lives, uh, that we, the trouble we get ourselves into or sin or, or pain or brokenness. Then we talked in the next week about my old farm pond and how that pond over a period of years had been silted in cattails and algae and duckweed. And, and finally last year, all the fish had died and, and, and I needed tractors to come out and they drained the pond and then they scooped out all the nasty stuff, the muck and the mire, and we started all over again. And then there was a, you know, a, our pond is fresh and new and beautiful. And so we talked about the need to be, to repent to recognize there's something that needs to be changed in us. And we do that on a regular basis. We repent, we become new creatures in Christ. We're born anew or born again. And that's what happened on my pond. And it's beautiful today and life-giving. And then last week, we talked about the power of the Holy Spirit and the tractor represented the Holy Spirit. And, and, uh, and as we looked at the tractor as the Holy Spirit, we talked about how, you know, if you try to farm without a tractor and you do it by hand, and I suggested the wheat harvest as an example, and you take a hand sickle and you start cutting wheat, you know, you can get uh, uh, about a third of an acre harvested in two days, doing it the old fashioned way by hand. You cut it one day and then you thresh it. Well, you got to let it dry, but then you finally thresh it the next day and, uh, and you can get about, about 640 loaves of bread out of a third of an acre, which you can do in two days. And then I contrasted that with a John Deere X9 1100, which is the latest, greatest combine. And it can harvest not a third of an acre in two days, but 30 acres an hour and produce a million loaves of bread, not 640, but a million loaves of bread over two days, so enough wheat for a million loaves of bread. And I said, that's what it's like when we operate on the power of the Holy Spirit. And so I encouraged you to be willing to open yourself to the work of the Holy Spirit, invite the Holy Spirit to work in your heart and life every single day. 
All right. So during these last few weeks, several of you have sent me a, a farmer's joke, a tractor joke, and, and I thought I might share it with you. So, um, so there were two, you know, husband and wife, they were, they were farmers. They did this together. The wife was actually the more mechanically inclined. The husband was the more agriculturally inclined. And so the wife took care of the equipment. The husband was the one who was out there working on, you know, working in the fields. And, uh, and one day the husband walks into the wife and says, honey, I, I got a problem with the tractor. And she said, what is it? He says, it's got water in the carburetor. He's, she says, water in the carburetor? Come on, how can it have water in the carburetor? And no, no, I'm telling you, it's got water in the carburetor. She says, you don't even know where the carburetor is. How do you know it has water in the carburetor? Well, where's the tractor right now? Let me just go take a look. And he says, well, that's the problem. It's in the middle of the pond. As a guy who's got my my tractor stuck in the middle of the pond, I I really appreciated that story. Well, today we're going to talk about what tractors were made for. What were tractors really made for? Farm tractors, what are they made for? What are they supposed to do? And then we're gonna look to see how does that help us understand our purpose in life, God's mission for our lives, where we find our greatest joy. So I was thinking about tractors and I was thinking about the tractor shows I've been to. And I love to go to tractor shows. And one year, this has been about 10 years ago, my father-in-law, father-in-law and I, Levon's dad and I, were at a tractor show at a state fair. This is a picture of Dick. He's, uh, you know, we were looking at these old tractors, an old John Deere 730 here. And, and there's other pictures here from different tractor shows. And, and you know, I just love seeing this. I just think they're so cool to go look at all these tractors. But the thing is, and these tractors, they're sometimes called like as car shows as well, trailer queens. Like they're trailered there to the spot. They're, they're set up at the show. And then you take them back home and put them in the barn and cover them up because these things have been carefully repainted, carefully restored, and they're old and you're not really meant to use them. They're only meant to be shown. And I think about that phrase, all show and no go. And that's the, you know, that's the tractor show, you know, the, the tractors, the tractor show sometimes, not all of them. Some of them are actually still operational, but that's, you know, you think about that and you go, nobody bought a tractor to put it in a tractor show. Right, every tractor that was built was built, well, maybe some old reconstructed tractors, but one I can think of, but generally tractors were built to be used. They're purchased to be used. They're they're purchased to be used to to plow the ground and then to plant the seeds and then to cultivate and then finally to harvest. That's what tractors were made for. Now I think about another use of tractors that you often see at shows and same same places, the county fairs oftentimes, you'll find tractor poles. And I don't know if you've ever been to a tractor pole or not, but they're kind of fun to watch. They started in 1929 in Missouri of all places and then Ohio also, and people brought their tractors out and they would see whose tractor was was it John Deere or Farmall or, you know, the, all these different tra- Olivers or whatever. And, and so they would try to compare their tractors to see who could haul the heaviest load 300, you know, 300 feet. And uh, there, here's a tractor pull right here. This is what often happens at a tractor pull. Take a look. Now there's a sermon in that video clip and uh, we're not gonna preach that sermon today, but sometimes when we use what God has given us, our influence or our physical, you know, our physical strength or, or you know, whatever it might be when we use our resources in a way that they weren't intended to be used, we end up flaming out, right? We just blow the whole thing up. And that's what often happens at tractor pulls because tractors weren't really made for that kind of thing. They, they can certainly pull, but they put them to the, you know, to the stress and it's all for people watching. It's all show, but no go. And so what I want to suggest to you is that in the scripture, we find that that's not really what we were made for was just for show. And there are some Christians who I think haven't maybe realized that. And so sometimes we show up at church, we've got our cross, we wear our cross in the world, we've got our Bible, you know, we're, we've got our bumper stickers and, and there we are, but sometimes we're all show and no go. We're actually, you know, thinking that we're consuming all this beautiful Christianity. It's all for me to help me know I was loved, I'm loved by Jesus and he's forgiven me and, and I'm going to heaven. And then we forget that all of that was meant to lead us to go out and do something in response to our faith, to serve God in the world, right? And so we're all show and no go, like those tractor, you know, those tractors at the tractor show or the tractor pull. And sometimes we end up, you know, misusing the gifts God has given us in a way that's harmful. All right, so instead of that, Jesus offers us a different picture. And it's interesting, the metaphor that Jesus most often uses to teach about what he was doing, what his ministry was about, and then what his disciples were supposed to do, and and then what we're supposed to do, they were almost always metaphors from agriculture, medical, metaphors from farming. So listen to this one. One of, one of his most famous parables, the parable of the sower, or perhaps better called the parable of the soils. So a farmer went out to scatter his seed, Jesus said. As he was scattering it, some fell on the path where it was crushed and the birds in the sky came and ate it. 
Other seed fell on rock. As it grew, it dried up because it had no moisture. Other seed fell among thorny plants. The thorns grew with the plants and choked them out. And later on, he says, that's the cares of this world and the desire for wealth of those, you know, those thorns that choke them out. Still other seed landed on good soil. Now, this is the point. When it grew, it produced 100 times more grain than was scattered. The seed that fell in the good soil are those who hear the word and commit themselves to it with a good and upright heart through their resolve they bear fruit. Now that's Luke's version. In Matthew's gospel, he says they, they bear fruit some 30, some 60, some 100 fold. But in any case, we were meant to bear fruit. We're meant to receive the word of God. So he says the seed is the word of God. And that word of God isn't the Bible. It's, you know, the Bible bears witness to it, but it's the message of Jesus. It's the story of Jesus. It's what Jesus does, what he says, what he says God's will is. It's the story that tells us that God loves us, that we matter to God, that our lives have meaning. It's the story that says that there's meaning, not only meaning and purpose, but there's also forgiveness and grace and there's hope for the hopeless and, and we're never alone and all of those kinds of things. It's also, the, it's also the word that says that we're to love God with all our heart, but also to love our neighbors. We love ourselves and to do good, to do justice and love kindness and walk humbly with God and to care for the poor and the hungry and the needy. All of those things are part of that word from God. And that word is sown into our hearts. And then it's meant to bear a harvest. Some people hear it and do nothing with it. It just bounces right off of them. Some people hear it and it starts to grow, but then, but then their faith remains shallow and it dries up and, and withers away. And some people begin to follow and allow that to start growing in their lives. But then the cares of this world and the desire for wealth end up choking it out. But, but Jesus says, some, some souls, some hearts, some people are like that good soil. And there's a, there's a harvest that's produced, some 60, some, some 30, some 60, some 100 fold. So this week I was looking at, uh, at strands of wheat and I've got several here. And, and I, I, uh, I asked my assistant, Stephanie, you know, can you get these off and, and, and count how many kernels of wheat are on here? And, and so each one of these average, like this one is probably about 45 and this one might be about 30 and this one's probably 25. And we had a few that might be a few more than that. And so, you know, if you got a hundred fold harvest, you planted one seed and you got one stock that came from that. And that one stock had a hundred wheat seeds, you know, wheat kernels on it. I mean, that's pretty amazing. And, and Jesus is saying, you know, we were all made to produce a harvest. I want you to imagine if a farmer went out and, uh, and, and began planting. And at the end of the harvest season, what they came up with was the same stock, but there was no wheat on it. No wheat at all. Would they be disappointed or would they be celebrating? And of course, if there's no wheat, what was the point of planting the, harvest or planting the wheat to begin with, right? This is what we're meant to look like, not this. But many of us, if we don't remember that, end up looking more like this than like this. I wanna ask you, are you producing a harvest for God? And what does that harvest look like? So we're meant to produce a harvest and we realize that, you know, a hundred fold harvest is pretty amazing. We, we should strive for that, but you know, 30 or 60 fold, that's great too. And again, this happens when we commit ourselves with a good and upright heart to God and to God's purposes. So here's the thing I want you to know. The harvest is every person who is positively impacted by you. Every person who's positively impacted by you is part of the harvest that you are meant to produce. So the sower in this parable is, is God to begin with. God is the farmer who sows. And then Jesus comes and Jesus is the, is the farmer. He's scattering the seed, preaching the word of God. But then everything that Jesus does when he walks on this, on this earth, we as his followers are meant to do when he goes to heaven. That's what he told his disciples. I'm gonna leave you here and you do the things that I did. And so now we are the farmers, right? And so not only are we meant to receive the word of God, but we're meant to produce a harvest. We're meant to impact the world around us. I want to ask you again, what does your harvest look like? So if the harvest is every human being that we touch, right? Part of that is the people who we help and encourage to come to faith in Christ. Part of it is the people that we, you know, we, they already are on the journey and we're watering the seeds. We're encouraging them and caring for them. Part of it is people who just are hungry in the moment. They just need food. And part of it's people who are experiencing injustice or pain or just in, in deep sorrow and, and it's coming alongside them. All of these things are ways that we produce a harvest and every single one of those people is a part of that harvest that you are producing. When you are caring for the world, you're caring for people, People, that all is part of your harvest. This week, I had a chance to see that in action at Vacation Bible Camp. So we had our VBC here at Church of the Resurrection, and it was really cool to see all of the children who were here. And we had 1,200 kids at our, you know, we have five area locations, soon to be six in Kansas City. And so we had 1,200 kids who were at VBC. And then we had 300 workers who were working with those kids. And, and it was just fun to watch the excitement and the enthusiasm of these children. And they were learning the scriptures every single day. And, and, and they were, you know, doing crafts and, and, and uh, music and drama. And all of this was tied into learning these scriptures. The word of God was being planted planted in their hearts and the goal was for them to produce a harvest. 
And I wanted to hear from some of the teachers. I, I pulled aside uh, four of the helpers for Vacation Bible Camp. And I just wanted to ask them, you know, tell me, why are you doing this? And, and what are you teaching the kids? And then how does it make you feel? And, you know, they, they laid out for us the four themes of this Vacation Bible Camp. So HERO, was, you know, was the big theme. And HERO was an acronym. It stood for, well, actually, let me let them tell you what HERO stood for. Take a listen. H in HERO stands for help. Stands for encourage. R stands for response. And my word is onward. Well, I'm Annalene Franklin, and I'm here volunteering at BBC, and I'm doing this to reach out to my community. Hi, I'm Lisa Thompson, and I'm doing this because I love working with kids. I'm Izzy Lentfer, and I'm helping with BBC this week because my nephews are in it, and I love seeing them get to grow this week. And then I also love helping all the other kids and getting to build those relationships with them. Hi, my name is Barry White, and I'm here with my grandson this week and he always has wanted me to be his teacher, so I saw this as an opportunity. Are you having fun doing this? So yeah. Fun. All right, let's head into the sanctuary. Let's see the kids. Thank you. Thank you. All right, you get the idea. It was really cool to see all of those adults pouring into those kids' lives and they were sowers of seeds or they were watering or they were cultivating or they were helping in the harvest. They were helping these kids grow in their faith. Every single one. So the, the average teacher had, you know, maybe 15 or 20 kids in their class. That was 20 kernels of wheat, right? That was 20 people whose lives they poured into. I spoke to a woman last week at vacation, uh, this past week at vacation Bible camp. And she said, I didn't want to do this. I just thought, you know, I just need a break from my kids and I don't really want to do this. And then I heard you preach the sermon on the Holy Spirit. And I thought, I think I'm supposed to do this. And she said, I, you know, I went ahead and volunteered late and I, I got up here and I started working and I said, how do you feel now? And she said, I'm so glad I did. It's been such a joy to watch these kids grow in their faith. It's just awesome. There's a joy in the harvest. There's a celebration that happens when you've been, you know, when you've been pouring into the lives of other people and blessing them and helping them grow. And, but here's what I saw also. These children who were growing in their faith, who were seeing the seed of God's word growing in their hearts, they also began to produce a harvest this week. And so every year with Vacation Bible Camp, we always have mission projects the kids are working on, ways of blessing other children like themselves. And so one of those was we have a ministry here in Kansas City where we provide beds for every kid who doesn't have a bed. They're sleeping on the floor, or on a couch, and we provide brand new mattresses, box springs. We provide brand new sheets and blankets and pillows and jammies for the kids. And, and so our kids were providing sheets and jammies and, uh, in this week. And so I wanted to tell you a little about what they did. They provided 502 sets of PJs, of pajamas. They provided 350. 50 sets of bed sheets for children receiving new beds. And I just thought that was really awesome. They were producing a harvest. Every kid who was impacted, who's going to wear those jammies or going to sleep on those sheets is part of the harvest that these kids were having by living out the gospel that they had learned. They were helpers and they were encouragers and they were responding to people's needs and they were encouraging, you know, helping people go onward and they were living onward for Christ. But there's one other project, and I wanted to tell you about that. So we do something local, and then we do something international. And internationally, we've done a lot in Malawi. And some of you have helped us with Malawi in the past. And so Malawi is a little sliver of a country. And, and uh, what we've been working on lately, and a number of organizations are doing this, we're working specifically in the communities where we've built boreholes or wells and built churches or schools or medical clinics. And, uh, and only in Malawi, somewhere between 11 and 15% of the population have access to electricity. So most people have no electricity. So what happens when the kids go home, you know, and, and in the wintertime, they're, you know, they're in school. And by the time they get home, they got an hour of sunlight before it gets dark, you know, and maybe there's a candle and maybe there's, a, you know, two candles in the house or whatever. How are they doing their homework? How are they living during that, you know, in that way? And so, you know, part of what we're trying to do is keep these kids in school. And so it's, you know, it was proposed that maybe we could help provide solar powered light kits for these homes. And there's a solar panel that's about this big and it goes on the roof. And then there's a, a power line that comes down and then you've got a battery that holds the electricity and then you've got plug-in lights. And these kits have about four uh, lights. This is what the kits look like actually. And so you can see, at least this is one of several that they're testing right now. And these are about $100 and it's pretty amazing. Well, I wanted you to hear from one of our staff members who actually works in Malawi. He's from Malawi, works in Malawi, and he's been helping to coordinate this program. And I wanted you to hear a little bit more about it from him. Take a listen. So we are here in Katumbu, Madisi, to roll out the solar light, uh, the solar home lighting project, uh, particularly targeting children who are in school so that we'll be able to provide them with some light to help them with their education. But now with the coming of this project, we are hoping that uh, uh, these children 
will be provided with some light to be able to read at night and prepare for the exam, prepare for their homework, and also be able to read so that they can improve in their performance at school and also be able to become somebody in the future. So this project, uh, we, the rollout project, we have gotten four different types of solar systems and we would like to test them. And out of the four, we choose the best. And by the grace of God, if we happen to get more funding, we reach out to more families because the, the need is great. So we are hoping that this solar light project would go a long way to uh, help these communities. You know what our kids did this last week? They donated $11,529.09 to provide 1,100, excuse, excuse me, to provide 115 light kits, solar light kits for families in Malawi. 115, and there's an average of seven people who live in each of these homes. You're talking 700, what, 800 people, 800 children and their families who are going to have light in Malawi. How cool is that? And then our missions team had already promised them, you know, whatever you give, we're going to match the first $10,000. So our missions team gave another $10,000, which is another 700 people who are going to be impacted by that. So suddenly there's 1,500 people who are going to have light in their homes in Malawi because of what our kids did in Vacation Bible Camp. And by the way, what I want to encourage you to think about doing, and I'm going to ask, you know, very specifically about this at the end of the service, I'd like to encourage you to join their children, to join our children in providing solar light for children and their families in Malawi. $100 provides one of these light kits for a family. And Levon and I are gonna provide light for about 20 families down there. And some of you, maybe you could provide a, a half a, you know, half of one or a quarter of one of these light you know, uh, kits. Maybe you could provide an entire light kit at $100. Or, or maybe you could provide 10 or 20 families with electricity and light. And how cool would that be? And you see every single one of those things that you do is another bit of the harvest that you've produced in your life. I have here, a hundred grains of wheat, and it's just hard for you to see probably on the camera. They're pretty small, but every one of these can be seeded, you know, and produce another harvest of another stock of grain that's another 30 or 50 or 60 or 100 grains that come out of it. And this is what it looks like, touching the lives of people, encouraging them, helping them, meeting them where they are. I want to ask you again, in the harvest that is your life, does it look more like this or like this? And the joy is found in looking like this in producing a harvest. All right, so I wanna tell you another story about agriculture. Jesus is uh, he's going through the region of Samaria in first century Palestine. As he's going through Samaria, he sends his disciples into a town and says, go get us something to eat. And he stays at the well. Now this is midday and midday, nobody's at the well. The women come at the break of dawn. They come or, you know, early in the morning to fetch the water, but not at midday when it's hot. Jesus stays by the well. Why is he staying by the well, sending his disciples into town? Well, there's a woman, Jesus knows, who comes to fetch water from that well every day around noon because, well, why does she come when there's no other women around? And most people reading the story have speculated that, that because she'd been married and divorced five times and was now living with a man who wasn't her husband, the women gossiped about her and made her feel ashamed. And so she came when they weren't there so she could fetch water. And Jesus is waiting for her. And and when she finally comes to the well, Jesus, you know, she's getting ready to draw water and she doesn't say anything to Jesus. And Jesus finally says, draw me some water, fetch me some water. And she looks at him and she's like, well, wait, you're a Jewish rabbi and you're asking me, a Samaritan woman? And she was thinking, but didn't say a sinner. You're asking me to get you water? You're talking to me? And Jesus says, if you knew who you were talking to, you would ask of me and I would give you living water and you would never thirst again. He's offering this woman something. He's offering her what she needs. He knows that she's married and divorced five times and living with a man. And in the first century, women didn't divorce their husbands. So there were five men who had divorced this woman and now a man who wouldn't marry her, but took advantage of living with her, right? And so there was a lot of pain and brokenness. We don't know what it was. You have to read between the lines, but Jesus waits there for her and he offers her living water. That is the Holy Spirit. He offers her life. He offers her love and grace and mercy. Right? And, and then the disciples come back and, they're, and they see Jesus and he's talking to this woman. It's like, well, what are you doing talking with this Samaritan woman, Jesus? Come on. And, uh, and the woman goes on into town, uh, goes back to her town and Jesus says this. Look, I tell you, open your eyes. Notice that the fields are already ripe for the harvest. I love that. The fields are already ripe for the harvest. He's saying, do you, do you know why I'm sitting here? I'm sitting here because there was a woman who was hurting and that woman needed help and encouragement and care. And I waited for her to offer her living water. Now, shortly after that, something amazing happens. 
the, uh, the disciples uh, are stunned when they see many of the people from, Samar- from that Samaritan town coming out to listen to Jesus. And, and in John, we read these words, many of the Samaritans from that town believed in him, believed in Jesus because of the woman's testimony. So she goes back and she becomes a missionary to her own people. This woman who was considered sinful is now a missionary for Jesus. She has found living water from him and she goes to tell other people what she's found and they come and they believe because of her testimony. And that's what this whole seeding and harvesting is all about. This is what it looks like. You know, sometimes it looks like providing food or, or bed sheets or, or lighting and electricity, solar panels for people in Malawi. And sometimes it looks like going to tell someone else what you found, that your life really does have meaning and that there really is hope and you think you've met the Messiah. So Saturday, this last Saturday, I went to CVS, uh, the, the drugstore just next to the church. And uh, I went there to get a birthday card early in the morning. I was heading to a birthday, p- birthday party and, and I walked in, I picked out the birthday card and I got ready to leave. And actually I'm standing there, I was looking for a gift card, uh, you know, to see if there might be something I'd wanna give uh, from their gift cards. I couldn't find one that I liked, but got the card. And, and I turned around and there's a man standing there and he's looking at me kind of quizzically. And, uh, and I said, hi, you know, how are you? And he said, are you, are you the pastor over there? Are you Adam Hamilton at Church of the Resurrection? I said, I am. I said, do you go to church there? And he said, uh, this church has saved my life over the last 10 months. I want you to know, I don't know where I'd be today without it. And I said, well, tell me, tell me more. What, what happened? What's your story? His name is Conk and Conk lives at uh, Tallgrass Creek. Uh, that's a retirement community just down the street from the church. And he said, 10 months, of my, 10 months ago, my wife died. And he said, we were soulmates. We were so close. And he said, I just, I didn't know how I was going to go on. And he said, two of your members who live at Tallgrass Creek said, Conk, you need Jesus. You need Jesus. Why don't you come to church with us? And they invited me to church of the resurrection. He said, I wasn't a religious person. I didn't go to church. And I, I got the impression maybe he worships online or maybe on TV. Uh, maybe he comes here. I'm not certain. But, but, uh, but he said, uh, he said, I started listening. And as I listened to the messages and the music and, and the prayers and all of that, he said, I found Jesus. And he said, I found hope and I found love and I found life and I found, you know, I found it changed me. And then he said, they invited me to Bible study. So I started going to Bible study. And he said, you know, having a community of people who were studying the Bible with me and helping me grow in my faith, he said, it was just, it was really remarkable. And he said, since then I've invited five other people to come to Bible study. And they started coming to Bible study. And he said, we got to the summer and they said, well, everybody's traveling. So, you know, we'll just not have Bible study during the summer. And, and Conk says, hey, wait a minute, I'll help coordinate it with everybody who's gonna be here. And so he started lining up teachers and helping to lead, you know, Bible study because he'd found it so rich and meaningful in his life. Do you see what this looks like? There were two people who go to resurrection who saw a man who was in need and who was hurting and grieving. And they said, you need Jesus and you need a church. Why don't you come with us? And then somebody else invited him to Bible study. Then he starts inviting other people to Bible study. And suddenly he's producing a harvest and people's lives are being changed. Let me ask you again, what does your harvest look like? How many people have been touched? How many people you know, have, have seen any kind of witness from you or heard from you? And I'm guessing probably almost everybody who's listening has impacted positively other people's lives. But that's what we were made for. Like the tractor was made for farming. We were made for harvesting, planting, you know, cultivating and harvesting. That's what we were made for. Uh, by the way, this is a picture of Conk and I in CVS. I asked him, I said, you know, your story is what I'm preaching about this weekend. Can I take your picture and tell the story? And, yeah, sure. Conk, thank you for allowing me to share a bit of your story. So I, I want to begin to wrap this up. I, I want you to listen to how Matthew summarizes Jesus' ministries. It's one, a ministry. it's one of my favorite passages in the gospel of Matthew. Jesus went through all the towns and villages. He didn't stay where he was in his house. He went out to where the people were. He went to all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness. So he's offering good news. He's offering encouragement. He's offering help. He's seeing where people are broken and he's trying to do what he can. He's doing what he can, which is quite a lot. He's Jesus to bring healing to people's lives. When he, I love this line. This is one of my favorite verses in all the Bible. When Jesus saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Right? He knew they were lost. And instead of saying, well, why aren't you in synagogue? And why? No, he doesn't condemn them. He doesn't judge them. He has compassion for them and he stops to help them. Now he went to where the people were. <clears throat> he offered good news. He cared for sick and discouraged people and broken people. And again, I love that line. He had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. Now listen, there was no shortage of people that needed Jesus. There was no shortage of people that needed help or encouragement or kindness or compassion or or mercy or, or something to eat. There was no shortage of those people, just like there isn't today in the world. 
And, and then Jesus said this, it kind of summarizes the entire passage. He says, then he said to his disciples, Matthew, Matthew knows, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. There are plenty of hurting people in the world. There are plenty of lost people in the world. There are plenty of confused people. There are plenty of people who are hungry or thirsty or in need of a coat or a, 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 you know, bed sheets or a pillow or jammies. There's plenty of people who need electricity or, or lighting at night. There's plenty of people who need a friend and need to be befriended. There's plenty. The harvest is plentiful. But Jesus laments the workers are few. Who are the workers? We are. This is what we were made for. We were made to go out into God's harvest fields to show kindness and compassion and care, to be in the words of the Vacation Bible Camp this week, to help and to encourage and to respond to people's needs and to ourselves and encourage others to move onward as we're following Christ. All right. I was boarding a plane recently from New York City to Kansas City. Levon and I had gone to New York City as uh, one part of our celebration uh, for our anniversary a few weeks ago. And when we were coming back, one of the, the morning flight had been canceled. And so there was, you know, a lot of people waiting to get on additional flights. And, uh, and so we were flying um, standby. And uh, the, the flight that we were standing by for, they had one seat left. And so I said, Levon, you take that seat. I'll wait. I'll, you know, you can come back and pick me up from the airport later on. So she got on the plane. I waited for the next flight. As I'm waiting there, the, uh, they finally called and said, okay, we have three seats left. And there was a couple and me who were next on the list. And, and so uh, there were two seats in the back of the plane and there was one seat in first class. I had Comfort Plus and I have Platinum Status with Delta. And so I, you know, they said, we're going to put you in first class. And this couple got to sit in the two seats in the back. And so I was great. I'm like, wow, how cool is this? You know, I'm sitting here up, fr up front and, uh, and I always, when something, you know, I end up in a, well, actually I kind of do this all the time. I try to pay attention to see, is there anything God needs me, needs me to do right here at this moment? And especially when I'm put in a seat that I wasn't assigned to, to begin with, I'm just thinking, is it, you know, is this maybe a divine appointment or is it just happenstance? And so anyway, the plane took off and, and then the, the, uh, the attendant came by and he said, okay, you know, we're going to provide your dinner. And it's a, it was a, or lunch, I think it was a boxed meal. And, and I said, oh, that's awesome. That's great. Not, not just peanuts. Nope. We're going to provide this. And so, uh, so he, uh, he said, these are your three choices. And I said, you know what, why don't you just see what everybody else wants? And then if there's anything left, I'll, I'll take whatever's left. And so he went and served everybody else. And he brought me back a little box and I opened it up and it was hummus with chips and I think some veggies or something. And, and so I said, great. And I, I stopped and I bowed and I prayed and I gave thanks to God for the meal and, you know, just thankful for my life and that I was on the plane and for the flight crew and all that. And when I was finished, I, I finished opening and unwrapping it and, and uh, got ready to eat. And the woman who was next to me had already had hers for a little while and she'd asked for an extra package of crackers. And she also had hummus like I did. And and she looked over at me and she said, uh, she said, I've got some extra crackers here that I didn't finish. It was an open package. She'd already opened it, but she said, I've got some extra crackers here. And, and uh, you know, if you'd, if, you'd like, if you'd like some. And now I don't usually take food from strangers, especially when they've already opened the package, but I just felt like, okay. And I started to say no. And then I thought, no, maybe you should say yes. I said, sure, thank you. That's really nice of you. She said, well, I heard what you said when you said you, you know, give the meals to whatever, you know, whatever everybody else wants, you know, let them have theirs and you'll take what was left over. And I thought, that was really cool that you did that. I saw that was not any big deal. And she said, she said, then I saw you stop and you prayed over your meal. And I thought, that's really cool that right here in the middle of the plane, you prayed over your meal. I saw it, you know, I'd try to do that at every meal. And, and uh, but I said, thank you, you know. And she said, uh, she said, oh, no, this is what I said. I said, so, do you go to church anywhere? And she said, yeah, no, I don't. She said, I used to go to church when I was younger. And she said, I went to this church and they were just so judgmental and it ended up really turning me off and turning, turning me away from church. I still believe in God, but I just got turned off. I said, I'm sorry, I know that happens sometimes. And she doesn't know I'm a pastor. We're just two people talking. And then she begins to talk about some things that are going on in her life that are troubling and, and challenging at the particular moment. And we begin to talk and she asked me, you know, I'm listening and, and uh, giving a little bit of advice, but not much or a little counsel. But then she, uh, she asked, what do you do? And I said, well, I'm, I'm a pastor. And oh, really? And so then we started talking about, you know, more things in her life and about faith and life and, and about you know, purpose and about leadership and a whole host of things. We had this really rich conversation, you know, over the next, over the next bit. And, and I said, you know, I just want to encourage you. I really think with the things you've described for me, it would it'd be a blessing for you to have a church, to have a church family, to surround you, to have a pastor you could talk to and, and maybe, you know, be able to come and pray with you over some of the things you're talking about and concerned about. And, 
And uh, so the great conversation, we got off the plane and, and we went over by baggage claim and I said, hey, would you mind, could I just pray for you right now? Would that be all right? And she said, sure, that, that'd be great. And so we joined hands right there by baggage claim, all these people all around us. And I just prayed and poured into her life in my prayer, you know, the things that she had talked about and told me that were troubling to her or concerns. And, and you know, several of those things we, I prayed for with her. And when I was done praying, she looked at me and she said, I can't tell you how much I needed this time with you on the airplane today, how much I needed this conversation and how much I needed your prayers. She said, would it be okay if I hugged you? And I said, of course. And so she wrapped her arms around me and I around her. And it was just this God moment. And I don't know what I was doing there. Was I planting or was I, was I uh, you know, cultivating or was I watering or was there a harvest happening? I, I don't know. I don't know if I'll ever see her again. But I know in that moment, this is what I felt when I walked away. I was right there in the middle of something God wanted to do in her life. And I felt such joy that I had a chance to have that conversation and that God put me there. And I was so glad I didn't just put my earphones in and keep my head down on the flight or that I didn't turn down her crackers when it was an opening for a conversation. That's what it looks like when we're daily living, expecting that God is gonna use us to accomplish his purposes in the world. I wanna ask you again, does your life look more like this or like this? And I wanna invite you to commit yourself to being part of the harvest, to being used by God to produce a harvest, some 30, some 60, some 100 fold, as you positively impact the lives of other people in the name of Jesus Christ. All right, that leads me to how we're gonna get this tractor off the chancel. So this week, of course, at Vacation Bible Camp, we were learning about heroes in the faith. And so let me put on my robe or my cape here. So I, I got a cape as a part of that. And, uh, and, you know, I got some work gloves here that I usually put on when I'm driving my tractor. And especially today, as we're gonna drive it off the chancel, I thought it might be helpful. And one of you gave me a really, just a nifty looking John Deere cap lately. And let's just, get this thing off the stage and see if it can't remind us of what we're meant to do. All right. Well, I want to share with you at the very end at our benediction, how it is that I managed to make it back on the stage so quickly and how we got that tractor out and back and a little bit of magic with the cameras to be able to pull all that off. First, I want to give you a couple of invitations. Next week, we kick off a new series of sermons, three weeks. It's going to be focused on the book of Acts and on, on renewing our faith. It really, it's just really aimed at leading right from this series to the next one. I don't want you to miss that. Pastor Scott's going to be preaching live next week here, and I, I will be preaching in Houston, Texas. I know we have many of you who join us from Houston on, on uh, online every week. If uh, you live in Houston, you'd like to join me. I'm going to be preaching on the power of the Lord's Prayer at Chapelwood United Methodist Church next Sunday morning. Sunday evening, I'm going to be speaking at Chapelwood on the future of Methodism. Monday night, I'm going to be speaking in Lufkin, Texas on the future of Methodism. If you live in any, anywhere near that or have friends who live in Houston, invite them to join me next Sunday for either worship in the morning or the gathering in the evening. I want to mention a couple other things. Actually, this is the big important thing I want to mention. As you heard me talk about uh, Malawi and these kids and the light kits, 
I know we can do more than 215 light kits. And I am thinking about every one of those kits goes to a family with seven people and that's 1,500 people we're gonna do already or a little, little less than that. But if you think you could contribute towards, maybe there's four lights in a light kit, you can provide 25 bucks that'll go towards one light kit. Or maybe you can buy an entire lit, light kit. Maybe you get your family and your friends together and you decide to buy five light kits or something. Maybe, maybe you decide to do, you say, well, you know, I'm in a place where I could do even more than that. You can bring light into darkness and we can all do something. I wanna invite you to do this, I invite you to join me. You can go to court.org slash next and you can find out more about this. You can use your cell phone and go to, again, uh, send a message to 77977 and send the message COR to 77977. You get the link back. When you get the normal link to give, scroll down past the general fund and you'll go to the next one and it's uh, VBC Kids Solar Light for Malawi or something like that. That's where you can give. I really wanna invite you. You have a chance to produce a harvest today, right now. Let's make a big difference. And we'll share with you what happened next week when we gather for worship once more. A couple last little things. We had a great VBC and this fall, we're gonna have a, our first ever Branson Kids and Family Retreat. And so this is gonna be going on in Branson, Missouri, October 14th to the 16th. And, uh, and again, uh, parents and their children, grandparents and grandchildren, you can come. It's gonna be a lot of fun. We'll be staying at a resort with an indoor swimming pool. We're gonna be uh, visiting the things around Branson. We're gonna have great devotions and a great chance to connect together. Plan to join us. Again, go to court.org slash next for more information. If you have yet to give to our school supply drive, and but you planned on it, I want to invite you to do that. If you already bought school supplies, don't forget to bring them back by, by next Sunday, July 31st. Uh, Levon, and, uh, Levon and Stella bought our school supplies this last week for a couple of second graders. And then Stella and I stood over and we prayed over those school supplies. If you're buying school supplies and bringing them, pray over them before you bring them in, that God will bless those children who get those school supplies right here in Kansas City. And, uh, and lastly, I want to invite you to join us Wednesday night. We're having a conversation right in here on, uh, on faith and abortion. A really important conversation. I think you'll find it meaningful. I'd like to invite you to join us. We're not gonna be telling you how to vote or what to do. We are gonna be inviting you to listen to people on both sides and for us to understand the issue better than we do right now. I think you'll find it meaningful. Plan to join us, you can join us live or you can join us online at court.org slash live. And now for the benediction, I'm gonna pray and pray us out. And then I'd love to invite you to stick around and watch and see how we got the tractor in here to begin with, with the help of Dave Webb, one of my friends, how we got the tractor in here. And it was a little more complicated than you'd think. And the reason why I couldn't drive it all the way out, but we had a twin of my tractor by the door. So I drove it off the stage. We had a twin of my tractor by the door uh, so I could drive it out because it would, it's impossible literally from, in fact, I'm hoping I could get my tractor back out of here after the service is over with. So take a look, uh, let's pray and then take a look. God sent us forth to be workers in your fields. Help us to pay attention and use us, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Take a look. Thank you for watching this week's sermon. We'd love for you to join us again online or live in worship. To learn more about Church of the Resurrection, please visit core.org. Have a great week.